If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. We will be looking at these two passages. Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2. I want to speak to you on the subject today of God's amazing grace. Folks, His grace is amazing. And we thank God for the grace of God. And if you have a bulletin and you are following along with us, there's three things I'd like you to see in our scripture today. Number one, we are chosen by God. We are chosen by God. We didn't choose him. He chose us. And we will see that in Ephesians 1. We are saved by grace. It's not by our works. It's not by who we are. If our daddy was a preacher or a deacon or if they taught Sunday school, we are saved by grace. And number three, and this is the one I love, we are secure in Christ. We are secure in Christ. And we believe as Baptists, once saved, always saved. And I like to throw this in, once saved, truly saved, always saved, because I, of many of, and many others, uh, you know, we, we uh, did not get it the first time. We prayed a prayer, and I know in my own life, and my own testimony, I made a false profession of faith when I was younger, and we'll be speaking about that in just a minute. I'm reading from the Baptist Faith and Message, Article 5, page 12 in that, and it's called God's Grace. Election is the gracious purpose of God according to which he regenerates, justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies sinners. It is consistent with the free agency of man and comprehends all the means in connection with the end. It is the glorious display of God's sovereign goodness and is infinitely wise and ho holy and unchangeable. It is. It excludes boasting and promotes humility. All true believers endure to the end. Those whom God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by his spirit will never fall away from the state of grace, but shall persevere to the end. Believers may fall into sin through neglect, temptation, whereby they grieve the spirit, impair their graces and comforts, and brings a reproach on the cause of Christ and temporal judgment on themselves. Yet they shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So grace, God's amazing grace. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 3. We are chosen by God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that God, the Father, was Jesus' Father. Okay? He, and Jesus was his Son. And when we come to Christ, uh, we are children of God. And look at this part. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Listen to me, folks. If you are saved, if you are a Christian, you are blessed by God. You think about it. When you die, you're going to heaven. When you want to pray, he is right there listening to your prayers. There is security in uh, your decision with him. Nothing, we'll read later on in Romans, nothing can take your salvation from you. And that's, that's just a few of the blessings that we have. But when he talks about spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, you have to understand, if you are a Christian, you're already there. Your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'm telling you, I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I reflect on heaven. Reflect on heaven. I had a dream the other night about my parents, and I was walking up to the gates. And, and again, it was as if I could reach out and touch them. It was so real. And I'm telling you, I woke up thinking, man, that has to be what it's going to be like. There were smiles on their face a mile wide. I was just seeing them uh, since they both have passed. And so we have to understand, because of who we are in Jesus Christ, we're already there. 
We're already there. And it says, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Now here's where it gets tricky. All right, election and predestination. And the reason I believe God did it the way he wanted to do it was because we can't take any credit for salvation. It is all God. Why? Before the foundation of, what is he talking about? He's talking about creation. Before creation, before he even thought about you, he chose his people who were going to be his church. So it has nothing to do with us. We weren't even a twinkle in our mama's eye. God chose us before the very foundation of the world. And folks, God doesn't make mistakes. And here's the deal. Here's the issue. All right? I believe we have free will. The Bible says, whosoever, whosoever believeth in him shall be saved. So there has to be a divine sovereignty. God it makes the choice, but it's human responsibility also. Now, how, how you work that out and how you think that out is totally up to you because there's lots of ways, uh, you know, people have told. There, I, one of the things that people have, have taught is that God knew you before you were being born, so he knew what you were going to do before that time. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm simply saying our focus needs to be on God, not on us. We have, I'm, I mean, again, we have choice. We have the freedom of choice. And I hope if you are here today and don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you will choose Jesus today. All of eternity rests on your choice there. But he has chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Why does he want us to be holy and without blame? So that we can, uh, so that we can uh, get other people thinking about Jesus Christ. To let people know that we are a Christian. To let people know that you know, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Folks, I'm telling you, grace and salvation is about God. It is God choosing you. And as I got older, I thought one of the cruelest things that we do when we were in grade school is choose people for teens. And the older I got, the more I thought how unfair that is. And as a youth minister, you know what I started doing? I started picking the one, I mean, the athlete, I wouldn't pick him first and everybody would just start looking around. I'd pick that person that I thought might be last. And folks, I'm telling you, it made a difference, not only in my life, but in the lives of others. We can be cruel in our picking people. But I'm telling you, God, it was 100% God. And if you're saved, God chose you and you need to thank God for his amazing grace. Verse five, having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. We have been adopted into God's forever family. And the reason we've been adopted is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a perfect life, a perfect life. He was born of a virgin. He was uh, crucified on a cross. And after three days, he arose and that gave victory over death. So it is God and Jesus. All three are in your salvation experience and the Holy Spirit is what pricks your heart and convicts you of your sin. So it's all part of salvation. But you have to understand you were chosen by God. John 44. I mean John 644. Look at John 644. 
The Bible says, and this is Jesus' words, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. I was uh, talking to a young man in Lawton, Oklahoma years ago, and here's what, and he was a college student, and here's what he said. I understand all that. I presented to the gospel. I was an evangelist, an explosion. I was a team leader. And here's what he said. He said, well, you know, I just want to live my life right now. But if I hear that trumpet, I'm going to uh, throw myself on the ground and I'm going to pray to receive Christ. And I said, there's just one problem with that. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that, you, that he will come in the twinkling of an eye. You're not going to have time to pray the sinner's prayer. And folks, that's why it's so important when God speaks to you and Jesus calls you and the Holy Spirit woos you, folks, you need to respond to God. You can't get, just, you can't get saved just any time you want. The Holy Spirit has to draw you according to that verse. John 15. Look at John 15. John 15, verse 16. Uh, you did not choose me, this is Jesus' words, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and whatever you ask in the Father's name, he may give you. But he says there in the first part, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Matter of fact, most of us weren't even looking for God. I know when God interrupted my life, I wasn't looking for God, but God came after me. Romans chapter 3, Romans 3, verse 10. It is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. You were a sinner when God found you. You were a sinner. There is none who understands. There is none who seek after God. I was not seeking God. I was seeking the world. They have all turned aside. They have come together to become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Well, here's my question about people that say, if you do good enough, I'm not that bad. I do good things. Well, let me ask you a question. When or how much good do you have to do to get in heaven? Because there's always somebody doing more than you're doing. And folks, we will see in just a minute, folks, it's not work. It's not what we do. It's who we have in our hearts that counts. And then the last scripture I want you to see under we are chosen by God, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah 1, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet of the nations. Before Jeremiah was even born, God knew him and God knew he was going to be a prophet. Folks, I am telling you, we are chosen by God and God gives us his amazing grace. The second thing I want you to see, we are chosen by God, but we are saved by grace. We are saved by grace. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. <laughs> Ephesians 2 verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, God's mercy has not given us what we deserve. God's grace has given us what we don't deserve. So I'm telling you, we all are under God's mercy and God's grace because of his great love, which he loved us. Oh, I know marriage, I, it is so important that, that the two that come together love one another. And folks, there is human love and there is God love. And what I'm saying, we can have characteristics of God's love, but God's love is like no one else's love. It is deep. It is strong. It is unchanging. It is giving his only son for you and I. Why did he do it? Because he loves you. 
because he knew when Adam and Eve sinned, it was broken fellowship with God. He knew there was a way that we can do this. And he sent his own son. He loved us so much, he sent his own son to die for us. Look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, notice the word dead. All right, what does it mean? We weren't physically dead, but we were dead spiritually. We weren't looking for God. We were living for ourselves. We made decisions for ourselves, but we were dead in our sin. And folks, I am telling you, if Christ doesn't intervene, you, if you die without Christ, you will spend an eternity in hell according to the word of God. So we were dead in our sin but made us alive together with Christ. Oh, folks, we were, we were alive by birth when we took our, our, uh, our first breath here on earth. And I always think of, you know, the doctor get, getting the kid and slapping them on the bottom and he starts crying like that. But I'm telling you, that's, that's what, what we are talking about spiritually is when we invite Christ into our lives, we are alive forevermore. We may taste the physical death, okay? And I, nobody knows when they're going to die. Only God knows that. But I'm telling you, spiritually, we will be alive forever. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you notice twice already in the two chapters in the scriptures we read, we are going to be in heavenly places. Folks, you have no clue what heaven's going to be like. We try to associate that to something here on earth, and it is nothing like what's in your mind. And if I could just say one word about heaven, it would be perfect. There's nothing here perfect. Now, you may have been on a perfect date, or you may have done something, and you thought, man, this is perfect. There's, there's some settings, all right? And you look out there over the mountains, or you see a sunset, and you think, this is perfect. And then we come back to the real world. God's love is perfect. Verse 7, that in the ages to come, that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. Oh, folks, I, I can't even express to you how kind and loving God is. He cares deeply for you. He hurts when you hurt. Jesus felt pain when he was here. He did. He was 100% man and 100% God. But I am telling you, God is there with you. Now, here's the verse. For by grace you have been saved. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is undeserved favor. Grace is, is God reaching down and giving us the opportunity to be saved. He's not going to make anyone be saved. I heard an evangelist when I was young say that if you are one of the elect, you will come down that aisle even if you're kicking and screaming. And I did not agree with what he said. Folks, again, that balance of divine sovereignty and human responsibility, because I'm just telling you, if you truly get saved, I'm telling you it is not only one of the best decisions or the best decision you'll ever make in your life, you're going to be happy about that decision. All right? And so that is important. By, by grace you have been saved. Through faith. Faith is belief. Faith is believing in something you haven't seen. And that's where most people trip up when it comes to salvation. People just say, well, I, I can't see. I, I can't believe. Well, folks, you have faith, and you exercise faith every day of your life. Every day. How many of you ate out this week? How many of you knew what was going on in the kitchen? But yet you ate it. You chomped down on it for all you knew. 
that chicken thing fell in the floor, that piece of chicken fell on the floor. He, he did the five second rule and slapped it back on the grill. That's a lot of faith. But listen to me. Faith is total trust in God. Faith is total trust in God's plan. And folks, His plan is for you to be saved, but you have to do it His way, not your way. For by grace you have been saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It would be as if uh, we were out on a boat and a big wind came up. And I'm just telling you, both me and, and you or whoever's here fell out of that boat. And this storm was blowing the boat everywhere. Okay, and, and all at once we were just thinking, man, if something doesn't happen, we're going to drown. And see, that's what I'm saying. If you're in a situation like that, you can't physically pick yourself up and throw yourself into the boat. But you know what God did? We were drowning in sin. And God reached down and picked us up and forgave us of our sins. Oh, folks, you can't do it on your own. You can't clean up enough. You can't serve enough. You can't do enough to be saved, folks. Listen to what it says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's a free gift. I'm telling you, if we had a birthday party, and even at my birthday party in June, I, I was opening my presents, and it would be like me saying, opening that, oh, that's awesome. How much do I owe you? I mean, my son would probably take the money, knowing Jonathan. <laughs> But what I'm saying is, if I have to pay him for the gift, it's not a gift. Okay? Grace is free. But listen to me. It costs God his only son. Don't take grace lightly, folks. It is God's amazing grace. Verse 10, for we are his workmen, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Oh, folks, we are saved by grace. John 3, 16. Most of you here could quote John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, folks, there's someone in this building that could be saved today. There's someone in this building uh, uh, that could repent of their sin. There's somebody in this building where God is going to speak to you and say, you know what? You need to be saved today. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he made him, talking about for he, God, made him Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Folks, I don't have my own righteousness, okay? We, we all mess up. We all fail miserably at times. But the righteousness we have is the righteousness of God. We are right with Him because of His amazing grace, because of Jesus Christ who paid for our sins. So we are chosen by God, we are saved by grace, and we are secure in Christ. Now, if I get a little excited here, don't, don't get nervous, all right? We're talking about great stuff here. We are secure in Christ. Romans 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Remember the old, my daddy can beat your daddy up? Well, my father can beat any father up. But he don't beat people up, he saves them. Amen. Okay, he saves them. Who? And he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not with him also give us freely all things? You think about all that we have in heavenly places, all that God does for us every day of our lives, protection, health, uh, friends, family, church. You could go on and on and on. He gives us this. 
Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Folks, I really don't have to account to mankind. Man, God is my witness. God is my lawyer. God is my defender. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even uh, at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. God in Jesus prays for you. I thank God for praying mamas. I had a praying mama, I promise you. I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for my praying mama. But to know that God prays for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep as the slaughter. Now, folks, Satan is after you. Satan does not, if you're a Christian, want you to be right with God. If you're a lost, Satan does not want you to be saved. He doesn't. Here's it. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm okay. How are you doing, really? How are you doing today? Oh, okay, I'm going to be honest. I'm just treading water. How are you doing today? Oh, I feel bad. Could I tell you what all is wrong with me? How are you doing today? Folks, I am saved. I am sanctified. I have been set apart for God. I am a conqueror according to the word of God. Quit acting like you're a dead man walking around. You are alive. God has saved you. You ought to have a smile on your face. You ought to be grinning ear to ear. What are you grinning about? I'm saved. What are you grinning about? I'm going to heaven. What are you grinning about? Ah, I'm fixing to go on vacation. <laughs> Folks, God gives us so much. Quit acting like you hang out in a funeral home. Okay? We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded, I love this, that neither death nor life. And again, if somebody came in here and threatened me and said, if you don't shut up, I'm going to shoot, I'll say, well, let me get out here where you got a good target. All right? And again, I don't have a death wish, but I'll be switched. I'll be switched if a guy tells me to get on my knees. I get on my knees for one person, and that is God himself. Amen. Pull the trigger. It ain't happening. Why? Because we are more than conquerors. Of course, soon as he pulls that trigger, I'm telling you, my Bible says to be absent from the Lord. The body is to be present with the Lord. I am saved. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other cre created thing <laughs> shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, folks, you're not just saved for a while. If you were truly saved, and really, folks, that's the question today. If you were truly saved, you will always be saved. John chapter 10. John 10, go with me there. John 10, verse 27. This is Jesus speaking. My sheep hear my voice. Folks, there is never any doubt in my mind when God speaks to me. All right, sometimes he has corrected me. Sometimes it's, it's almost like he has said, you knucklehead, why did you do that again? And there's other times it says, hey, thank you for what you're doing. Oh, faith, folks, I know when God speaks to me. Why? Because I'm a sheep. I'm one of his. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I wonder how many times in the Word of God we see that word, follow me. What did he say to his disciples? Follow me. Folks, we got to keep following God. As long as we're breathing God's air, we need to follow God. And I give him eternal life, and they shall never perish. Don't you like the word never? Never perish. 
neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Oh, folks, I believe with all my heart when you get saved, I'm telling you, God puts his hand around you. Jesus puts his hand around you, and you are wrapped in the Holy Spirit. And for you not to be saved, something would have to break the power of the Holy Spirit. Pull back the hand of Jesus and pull back the hand of God. It ain't going to happen, folks. It is not going to happen. We are secure in Christ. Verse 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father am one. And then uh, another First John, we're about finished. First John chapter 5. First John 5. These things have been written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Listen to me, sir. God's not playing games with you. Man, ma'am, he's not playing hide and seek. You can see God all around you. And I'm telling you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, he's telling you, you need to be saved. You need to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. You need to repent of your sins and come make a public profession of faith. The last verse I want you to re read to you, Revelation 3. It's not in your bulletin or, or in your sheet, but this morning early, early this morning, God gave me this verse and said, you closed with this verse. Revelation 3, 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Oh, folks, God may be knocking on your door right as we speak. Knocking on your door. He's not going to break the door down. He's not going to make you get saved. The invitation is clear. But he asks you to do one thing by faith. Open the door of your heart. Open the door and let him in. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for your amazing grace. And God, I, I know even predestination, I, I don't know all that is, but all I know is before the foundation of the world, God, you chose Christians. You got your church. And Lord, I just pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, they would come forward today and all they have to say is, I need to be sure. I need to accept Jesus Christ into my life. God, I know the Bible says after they do that, it, all the angels of heaven will be rejoicing. So God, I pray your spirit would fall on this place. God, I pray that your, your Holy Spirit and even angels would be here to guide folks to you. You want them saved. But God, you ask them to take that step of faith. That first step is the hardest one. God, I pray, Lord, that if you convict hearts, that they will come to you, that they will come to Jesus by faith and be saved. God, there's still Christians here that they're just not totally right with you. Oh, they do <clears throat> good things, but they're not totally right with you. God, I pray maybe they would come and consider rededicating their life to Christ or following the Lord in baptism or even moving church membership. Maybe they've been here and they know who we are and they want to be a part of our church. God, we will receive them gladly. So God, this is in your invitation. This is your church. And God, you do with it what you choose. And God, we will give you the glory, you the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?